This is George Gilbert. We're on the ground at Demand Base, the B2B CRM company based on AI, one of uh, uh, a very special company that's got some really unique technology. We have the privilege to be with Seth, Seth Myers today, senior data scientist and resident wizard, and who's going to take us on a journey uh, through some of the technology Demand Base is built on and some of the technology coming down the road. So Absolutely. Seth, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So, um, we talked earlier with Aman Neymat, mm -hmm. um, Senior VP Technology, and we talked about some of the functionality in, in demand base mm -hmm. and how um, it's very flexible and, and reactive and adaptive uh, in helping guide uh, or react uh, to a customer's journey mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Th through the buying, buying process. Tell us about what that journey might look like, how it's different, and you know the touch points and the participants and and then how how your technology rationalizes that mm -hmm. because we know old CRM pro packages were really just you know lists of contact points right so this is something very different right how does it work yeah absolutely so i mean at, at the highest level each customer is going to be different. Each customer is going to make decisions and look at different marketing collateral and respond to different marketing collateral in different ways. You know, as, as companies get bigger and their products offering become more sophisticated, um, that's certainly the case. And also, you know, sales cycles take a long time. You know, you, you, you're engaged with an opportunity over many months. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of touch points. There's a lot of planning that has to be done. Uh, so that actually um, offers a huge um, opportunity to, uh, to be solved with AI, um, especially in light of recent uh, developments in this thing called reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is basically machine learning that can think strategically. They can actually plan ahead in a series of decisions. And it's actually technology behind AlphaGo, which is that uh, the, the Google technology that, that beat the best Go players in the world. Um, and what we basically do is we say, okay, if we understand, uh, if we understand your your customer, we understand the uh, the company they work at, we understand the things they've been researching elsewhere on third party sites, then we can actually start to predict about content they will be likely to engage with. But more importantly, we can start to uh, predict content they're more likely to engage with next and after that and after that and after that. And so, what our technology does is it looks at all possible paths that your that your uh, potential customer could take, all the different content that you could ever suggest to them, all the different routes they will take. And it looks at the ones that are likely to they're likely to follow, but also ones that are likely to turn them into an opportunity. And so we basically, in the same way Google Maps considers all possible routes to get you from your office to home, we do the same and we choose the one that's most likely to convert the opportunity, the same way Google chooses the quickest road home. Okay, this is really it's a that's a great example because people can picture mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But how do you um, how do you know what's the best path? Is it based on learning from previous journeys yes. from customers? Yes. And then, if you make a wrong guess, you sort of uh, penalize the engine mm -hmm. and say, pick the next best. What you thought was the next best path. Is Absolutely. That yeah. So, so basically, the way the, the nuts and bolts of how it works is we, you know, we start working with our clients, and they have, um, you know, they have all this data of uh, different customers and how they've engaged with different pieces of content and, and uh, throughout their journey. And so, the machine learning model, what it's really doing at any moment in time, given any customer in any stage of the opportunity that they find themselves in, it says what piece of content are they likely to engage with next. Uh, what and that's based on historical training data, if you will, and then once we make that decision on a step-by-step -step basis, then we kind of extrapolate, and then we basically say, okay, if they if they if we showed them this page, or if they engaged with this uh, material, what would that do? What, what what situation would we find them in the next step? And then what would we recommend from there? And then from there? And then from there? And so it's really kind of learning the right move to make at each time, and then extrapolating that to all the way to the opportunity being. being closed the picture that's in my mind is like uh the the deep blue i think it was chess mm -hmm. you know where it would map out all the potential moves very similar to the idea. end game very similar idea so what about if if you're trying to engage with a customer across different channels mm -hmm. and it's not just web content yes how is that done 
well, that's something that we're very excited about, and that's something that we're that we're currently uh, really starting to you know devote resources to. Right now, we already have a product live that's focused on web content specifically. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're working on kind of a multi-channel type solution and we're, and we're all pretty excited about it. Okay, so obviously you can't talk too much mm -hmm. about it. Can you tell us sort of what channels that might touch? Um, I might have to play my cards a little close to my chest on this okay. one, but uh, I'll just say we're excited. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, I guess that means I'll have to come back. Okay, yeah, <laughs> for... please, please. So um, so d tell us about the, the, the personalized conversations. Mm -hmm. Is the conversation just another way of saying this is how we're personalizing the journey? Or is there more to it than that? Yeah, it, it really it really is about personalizing the journey, right? Like, you know, a, a lot of a lot of our clients now have a lot of sophisticated marketing collateral and they have a lot of a lot of time and energy has gone into developing content that the different people find engaging, that kind of positions products towards pain points and all that stuff. And so really there's so much low hanging fruit by just organizing and leveraging all of this material and actually forming the conversation through a series of journeys through that material. Okay. So um, Aman was telling us earlier that, that you know, we have so many sort of algorithms. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all open source or they're all published, mm -hmm. and they're only as good as the data you can apply them to. Right. So tell us, um, where do companies, um, startups, um, you know, not the Googles, Microsofts, right. Amazons, where do they get their proprietary information? Is it that you have um, algorithms that now are so advanced that you can refine raw information into proprietary information that others don't have, or? Uh, I mean, r really, I think it comes down to, uh, like, our, our competitive advantage, I think, is largely in the source of our data. Um, and so, uh, yes, you know, you can build more and more sophisticated algorithms, but again, if you're starting with a public data set, you'll be able to derive some insights, but there will always be a path to those data sets for, say, a competitor. Um, for example, we're currently tracking about 700 billion web interactions a year, and then we're also able to attribute those web interactions to um, you know, companies, meaning the employees at those companies involved in those web interactions. And so that's able to give us an insight that no amount of public data or processing would ever really be able to uh, achieve. How, how do you, Aman was, was uh, started to talk to, to us about how, like there were DNS, reverse DNS registries or something reverse like IP that. Reverse IP lookups, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So is, how are those, um, if they're individuals mm -hmm. within companies and then the companies themselves, how do you identify them reliably? Right, so re reverse IP lookup is, we, we, so we've been doing this for years now, and so we've kind of uh, developed a, a multi-source solution. So, you know, reverse IP lookups is, is a big one. Um, also, machine learning, uh, you know, you, you can look at a traffic coming from an IP address and you can start to make some very, uh, you know, informed decisions about what the, what the IP address is actually doing, who they are. Um, and so and if you're looking at at the account level, which is what we're tracking at, um, it's, yes, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of information to be gleaned from that type so of information. So sort of the way, and this may be a, a weird sounding analogy, but the, the way a, a virus or some piece of malware has a signature in terms of its behavior, mm -hmm. you find signatures in terms of users um, associated with an IP address. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and we, we certainly don't de-anonymize individual users, but if we're looking at things at the account level, um, then, you know, you know, bigger the data, the, the more signal you can infer. And so if you're looking at a company-wide usage of an IP address, then you can start to make some very educated guesses as to, to who that company is, the things that they're researching, what they're in market for, that type of thing. And, and um, how do you know, how do you, how do you find out you know, if if they're not coming to your site, and they're not coming to mm -hmm. one of your customers' sites, mm -hmm. how do you find out what you know what they're touching? Right. I mean, like I, I can't really go into too much detail, but a lot of it comes from working with publishers, uh, and you know, a lot of this data is just raw, and it's only because we can identify the companies behind these IP addresses, and, and that we're actually able to actually turn these web interactions into insights about specific companies. Sort of like how like. Uh, advertisers or publishers would track visitors mm -hmm. across many, many sites mm -hmm. by having agreements. Yes. Okay. Yeah, along those lines, yeah. Okay, okay. So um, 
tell us a little more about um, natural language processing. I think um, where most people have assumed uh, or have become familiar with it is in, with the B2C um, capabilities yeah. with the big internet giants mm -hmm. where they're trying to understand all language. Yes. You have a more well-scoped problem. Tell yes, us how absolutely. that changes your approach. So, so a, a lot of really exciting things are happening in natural language processing in general and research. And, and uh, right now, in general, it's being measured against this yardstick of can it understand language as, better as, a, as good as a human can. Obviously, we're not there yet. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can't derive a lot of meaningful insights from it. And the way we're able to do that is instead of trying to understand all of human language, let's understand very specific language associated with the things that we're trying to learn. So uh, obviously we're a B2B marketing company, so it's very important to us to understand what companies are, you know, are investing in other companies, what companies are buying from other companies, what companies are suing other companies. And mm -hmm. so if we if we said, okay, we only want to be able to infer a competitive relationship between two businesses in a natural document, that becomes a much more solvable and manageable problem as opposed to let's understand all of human language. And so we actually started off with these kind of open source solutions with some of these proprietary solutions that you know we, we paid for. And, they didn't work because their scope was this broad. And so we said, okay, we can do better by just focusing in on the types of insights we're trying to learn and then work backwards from them. So tell us how much um, of the algorithms that we would call built, you know, building blocks mm -hmm. for what you're doing and others, how much of those are all published or open source and, and then how much is your secret sauce, because we talked right. about data being key part of the right. secret sauce. What about the algorithms? I mean, yeah, you, you can treat the algorithms as tools, um, but you know, a, a, a bag of tools a product does not make, right? So it, it really comes, our secret sauce becomes how we use these tools, how we deploy them, and the data sets we, we put them against. So uh, as I mentioned before, you know, we're not trying to understand all of human language. Uh, actually the exact opposite. So we actually have a single machine learning algorithm that all it does is it learns to recognize when Amazon, the company, is being mentioned in a document. So in, so if you see the word Amazon, is it talking about the river? Is it talking about the company? Uh, so we have a classifier that all it does is it fires whenever Amazon's being mentioned in a document. And that's a much easier problem to solve than understanding, you know, than Siri, basically. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I still get rather irritated with Siri. <laughs> So let, let's talk about um, broadly this topic that sort of everyone lays claim to as their great, you know, higher calling, which is democratizing, mm -hmm. you know, machine learning and AI and yep. opening it up to a much greater audience. Mm -hmm. um, s help set some context, just the way you did by saying, hey, if we narrow the scope of right. a problem, it's easier to solve. Mm -hmm. What are some of the different approaches people are taking um, to that problem? and and what are their sweet spots? Right. Um, so, I mean, the, the kind of the talk of the data science community, the talk of machine learning right now, is some of the work that's coming out of uh, DeepMind, which is a, a, a subsidiary of Google. Um, they just uh, built AlphaGo, which you know solved a strategy game that we thought we were decades away from actually solving. Um, and I, th their approach of restricting the problem to uh, a game, to with well-defined rules, with a limited scope. Um, I think that's how they're able to propel the field forward so uh, significantly. Um, they start off by playing Atari games, then they move to you know long-term strategy games, and now they're doing video games, um, uh, like video strategy games. And I think the idea of again narrowing the scope to well-defined rules and well-defined limited settings is how we're actually they're actually able to advance the field. Let me ask just a, about the playing the video games. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember the Star Starcraft. Yeah, Starcraft. Would would you call that like? where this, the video game is a model and you're training a model mm -hmm. against that other model. So it's almost like they're interacting with each other. Right, so, so it really comes down, you can think of it as um, pulling levers, right? So you have a very complex machine and there's certain levers you can pull and the machine will respond in different ways. Um, you know, if you're trying to, for example, 
build a robot that can walk amongst a factory and pick out boxes. Like there's how you move each joint, how you, you know, where you look around, all the different things you can see and sense. Those are all levers to pull. And that gets very complicated very quickly. But if you narrow it down to, okay, there's certain places on the screen I can click. There's certain things I can do. There's certain inputs I can provide to the video game. You basically limit the number of levers and then optimizing and learning how to work those levers is a much more scoped and reasonable problem as opposed to learn everything all at once. Okay, um, that's interesting. Now, uh, let me switch gears a little bit. Sure. And you know, we're, we've done a lot of work at, at uh, Wikibon about um, IoT mm -hmm. um, and edge. You know, increasingly edge-based intelligence because you can't go back to the cloud. You know, for your analytics right. for everything. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's becoming apparent is it's not just the training that might go on in the cloud. Yes. But there might be simulations, you know, and then the sort of low latency response is based on a model mm -hmm. that's at the edge. Yeah. Help elaborate what that really, where, where that applies and how that works. Right. Well, in, in general, um, when, you know, when you're working with machine learning in almost every situation, training the model is that's really the data intensive process that requires a lot of extensive computation, and that's something that makes sense to have localized at a single location, which you can yeah. leverage resources and you can optimize it. Um, then you can say, all right, now they have this model that understands the problem that's trained, it becomes a much simpler endeavor to to basically put that uh, as close to the, you know, the, the, the device as possible. Um, and so that really is, is how they're able to say, okay, let's take this really complicated, you know, billion parameter neural network that w took days and weeks to train and let's and let's actually derive insights at the level uh, at, at, right at the, de at the device level um, recent technology though like I mentioned deep learning that in itself just the actual deploying the technology pr creates new challenges as well to the point that actually Google invented a new type of chip to just the run tensor yeah, the, 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 te the TPU the tensor processing unit just to handle what is now a, a machine learning algorithm so sophisticated that the, that even deploying it after it's been trained is still a challenge. Is there a difference in the in the hardware that you need for for training versus uh, inferencing? So they, they 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 initially deployed the TPU for just for the sake of inference. Um, in general, uh, the way it, the way it actually works is that when you're when you're building a neural network, there's a type of mathematical operation to do a whole bunch. Um, and it's it's basically the idea of working with matrices. Matrix, and so, yeah, yes. it's like that. Um, that's still absolutely the case with training as well as inference, um, or actually, you know, querying the model. Uh, but they, they, yeah, so if you, if you can solve that one mathematical operation, then you can deploy it everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if, um, if, one of our, our, our CTO mm -hmm. was talking about how, in his view, what's going to happen in the cloud is richer and richer simulations. Mm -hmm. And that they, as you say, the querying the model, getting an answer, yeah. you know, in real time or near real time mm -hmm. is out on the edge. What exactly is the role of the simulation? Is that just a, a model that understands time and not just time, but many multiple parameters that it's playing with. Right. So, so simulations are particularly important. In taking this back to reinforcement learning, where you basically have many uh, decisions to make before you actually see some sort of, you know, desirable or undesirable outcome. And so, for example, the way AlphaGo trained itself is basically by running simulations of the game being played against itself. And really what that simulations are doing is allowing the artificial intelligence to explore the entire possibilities of, of all games. You know, sort of like war games, if yes. you remember that movie. Yes. with uh, that, yeah. yeah, Matthew Broderick. Exactly, it, yeah. And it actually showed all those war game scenarios mm -hmm. on the screen yes. and then figured out you couldn't really win. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. It, it's a similar idea where, where they, and because, for example, in, in, in Go, there's more board configurations there are atoms in the observable universe and so you like you know the way the way deeply won chess is they basically more or less explore the vast majority of, of, of chess moves um you can't that's really not the same option you can't really play that same strategy with alpha go and so this this constant simulation is how they explored the meaningful game configurations that it needed to win so in other words they, they were rather they were scoped down so the the problem space was smaller. Right, and, and in fact, basically, the, one of the reasons, like AlphaGo is really kind of two different artificial intelligence working together. One that decided which 
solutions to explore, like w which possibilities it should pursue more and which ones not to, to ignore. And then the second piece was, okay, given a certain board configuration, what's likely outcomes? And so those two working in concert, one that narrows and focuses and one that comes up with the answer given that focus is how it's actually able to work so well. Okay. Yeah. Seth, on that note, that was a very, very uh, enlightening 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> And uh, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> we'll have to come back and get an update from you soon. All right, absolutely. This is George Gilbert. I'm with Seth Myers, um, senior data scientist at Demandbase, um, a company I expect we'll be hearing a lot more about. And we're on the ground, and we'll be back shortly. <laughs>